Okay. So um, I'm delighted to see so many people here uh, in the morning, kind of, um, wanting to hear a talk about Hannah Arendt's political philosophy of privacy. This is Julia Maria Munich. She has written her dissertation about this topic and about Hannah Arendt. And I think uh, she just um, was very successful in, I don't know what verteidigen in yeah, English is. Defended it. Yeah. Defending it. <laughs> <laughs> so, give her a warm applause for that. <laughs> and her current project is um, called The Luxury of the Private Life, a Privilege for the Lucky Few. So, um, maybe this is a question of her talk too. Her talk will be all about the phil phil philosophical concept of privacy, um, why we need to protect it, and um, how, why we need to, to protect it because we want to prevent totali totalitarianism. Sorry, it's very early for me too. <laughs> so um, I'm very, yeah, delighted to, to hear the talk because I'm a fan of Hannah Arendt myself. Okay. So it's your stage now and um, have fun. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here and that the organizers picked my talk. Um, yeah, I'm, you can see the topic and the title of my talk on my first slide. And I have to admit that there are already a few questionable points about it. Uh, actually, all of them, as you can see. <laughs> Louder? I don't know. Louder? Do you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Okay, so can you hear me better now? Should I speak louder? Does it help? Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks. So if you can hear me now, I'm going to tell you what you can question about my title. <laughs> um, first, there is a the notion of household, um, which has been criticized uh, as a concept of privacy by the, by the feminist, feminist sorry, um, theorists. Um, if you say that the private realm is just the household sphere, I'm going to come back to all of these topics, just a brief um, idea on uh, why every title can be questions. Um, and then the totalitarianism point, um, I don't know if you know that totalitarianism is a term which has been uh, um, defined in the 20th century to describe what is common between uh, or what um, national socialism and socialism do have in common, and that's why some uh, people are not very happy with this talk, uh, with this term, sorry. Um, and then the word cyberspace, I guess, in this, um, with this audience, I don't have to explain that it is rather old-fashioned by now already, uh, like a 90s term. And then I promised you that I'm going to talk about philosophical perspectives on privacy, but I'm going to talk about other concepts too, because today's privacy research is very interdisciplinary, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, that, that might be too loud. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about the definitions of other disciplines too. Is that my fault? No, it isn't. Um, and then yesterday, uh, a person pointed out to me that even the word privacy, of course, is problematic in itself because some people do claim that uh, we are in a post-privacy era now. And then Hannah Arendt, as I'm going to explain later, herself is also a kind of uh, um, problematic uh, theorist in some points. So what I'm going to do today is I'm trying to briefly define what privacy means, and then I'm going to say what Hannah Arendt means by privacy, and I'm, I hope I can make some points about why we need to protect privacy, and I'm going to draw on some examples from the uh, current discussion today. So there's one, if there is one thing that privacy scholars and privacy activists do agree on, then it is that privacy is hard to define. 
And uh, that's the reason why we very often use metaphors to describe uh, the private. For example, the word realm, the private realm, the private sphere, very often they are uh, spatial images to grasp this concept of the private. And then there is another problem um, that the German terms that are used, that are being used like Privatsphäre or Kernbereich privaten Lebens, which is a term by the German Constitutional Court, um, they don't have the exact same meaning as the word privacy in English. So we have to deal with that too. And a lot of these definitions are ex negativo definitions, which means they do describe the opposite of the public, or let's say the private is only defined as the opposite of the public, which of course poses the question whether the private doesn't have um, points in itself and, and um, yeah, can be defined as a, a concept by its own. Um, and the attempts to define uh, privacy are mostly normative, um, and some of them are descriptive, um, but as I brought this quote by Beato Rössler, as nothing belongs by nature in the realm of the private, of course those concepts are normative, and very often they already claim that the private needs to be protected. And there is um, a close relation uh, to other abstract nouns like freedom and security, as for example, you know, a lot of politicians try to tell us that we only can have one of them and not all together. So brief historical overview. The first definition um, of privacy can be seen in Aristotle's politics uh, when he uh, describes the difference between the oikos, which is the household, and the polis, the political public sphere. Um, but it has been questioned whether this is really the exact same thing that we do mean when we talk about privacy and public publicity today. Um, so in the medieval times, in the Middle Ages, um, the private-public distinction didn't play a big role um, because the church was influencing everything. So it's actually with the liberalist theorists of the uh, 17th century that the real debate about public and private does begin. Um, even though some of them don't use the word privacy, for example, Thomas Hobbes, which I've named here as first example, um, he talks about um, expression of freedom, um, free expression of mind and um, about the uh, religious freedom. So, but th that can be seen as a private. Um, and then there is, in the, at the end of the 19th century, a very um, influential paper by Samuel Varon and Louis Brandeis, which some of you might know, because they defined or they claimed a right to be let alone. But those are lawyers, they are not philosophers. So. <laughs> and then in the 20th century, um, I, I, I have uh, Norbert Elias, who um, already um, talked about the private before the Second World War, but the others I've named here, they are dealing with the private in relation to what happened in the, during the Second World War or during the Shoah, you have to say. Very important is also the feminist critique in the 1960s and 1970s. I already mentioned it earlier. Then I brought um, some of the names of the feminist theorists who have written influential um, papers because, um, of course, if we consider the private realm as a realm into which the state or the government isn't allowed to interfere at all, then this realm can, for example, cover up violence against children. And so, of course, there are legal issues with this. And in Germany, for example, um, related to this feminist critique, the marital rape, um, which means the Vergewaltigung in the Ehe, is only um, strafbar, so I use the German words, since 1997, which means that a wife which has been uh, raped by her husband didn't had any, have any chance to uh, report this to the police, or she could report it, but it wouldn't have been considered as a crime as far as they are, as long as they are married. As well as education without violence, I uh, translated it, it's um, das Recht auf gewaltfreie Erziehung for children, for kinder, 
uh, in 2000, uh, it's, um, yeah, in German we say it's die berühmte Ohrfeige, die nicht schadet, which finally did become a crime. Um, and of course there is the informationelle Selbstbestimmung, the informational self-determination, which has been um, defined uh, by the uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht, the German Constitutional Court, in 1983, in, um, in terms of the um, macro-sensors um, um, case, sorry. <laughs> and uh, here we already see that those are all issues which are, can be defined as private issues, but they are so broad that uh, scholars tried to um, grasp them better by defining dimensions of privacy. And uh, for example, there is a proprietary privacy, the local dimension of privacy, the decisional dimension of privacy, then informational privacy, and there are very important are the temporary aspects of privacy. And um, to define those better, I'm uh, again uh, quoting Beate Rössler, uh, who says that decisional privacy, which is closely related to decisional freedom actually, um, is a claim, is when someone claims the right to protection from unwanted access in the sense of unwanted interference or heteronomy in our decisions and actions. So we have to be able to uh, make our own decisions. And uh, this word decisional privacy comes from the US American debate about abortion, for example. Then informational privacy, this is um, what we also call data protection. It means when people claim access to information about them that they have no desire to see in the wrong hands. And then there is the local dimension of the private, which is sometimes considered to be the classical uh, definition. It is the right to protection against the admission of other people to spaces or areas. And the proprietary dimension is very closely related to the latter one. So I come to the philosopher I'm going to talk about today, Hannah Arendt, who is a political theorist from the 20th century. She was a German Jew and she had to emigrate from Germany in 1933, first to France, then later in the 40s to uh, the USA. And um, she was a philosopher before she had to emigrate, but then she said she doesn't want to touch any intellectual uh, thing again. Uh, luckily, she changed her mind on that later on because otherwise she wouldn't have written all these great works. But uh, she first didn't write anything again because she said, how could I, with what is happening in Germany how, or in Europe, how could I just uh, write philosophy again? And so she, she kind of changed to political theory. And her most famous books are uh, her report on the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, and um, it has been criticized a lot because, um, yeah, it was a real um, big, dis it caused a debate in um, the Jewish community in the States and also in Israel. Um, uh, and two other famous books of hers are The Origins of Totalitarianism, which appeared already in, uh, was published in uh, 51 already, um, and The Human Condition, which in German is called Vita Activa, and this is also very interesting about Arendt because a lot of her works do have two separate versions, like the English version she wrote and then she herself made the German translation and changed a lot of the text. Um, so she has been criticized, as I already said, about the Eichmann trial um, and she has been criticized because she was not a feminist and m might even be considered to be anti-feminist. And her methods are kind of interesting because she has kind of an ec eclectic style and she quotes from the Bible and from poems and so it's really uh, kind of a mix. But she said she wrote to be able to understand and that's what interested her. She didn't want to write a, a coherent theory as such. Um, one thing she was criticized about too was her uh, paper on the Little Rock debate, I'm going to come back to that later. 
Hannah Arendt's motto, as I call it here, is this never ought have happened, dies hätte nie geschehen dürfen in German. Um, she meant by this, as she clarifies herself, the Holocaust, the Shoah, but not only, as she says, the number of the victims and the brutality of, of what had been done, but the mass fabrication of bodies, these are her words, that the, the terror and the, the murder was industrialized. And this is also the starting point from her, her political theory. I give you a very brief overview about her ideas, other than her ideas on the private, which I will explain later, because in fact she is a philosopher of the public, actually. Um, the public realm was her, very important to her. She wanted to protect it because it was what had been destroyed in totalitarian systems. The realm in which people can come together and act freely together politically. We've seen that interestingly in, in the Arabic uh, Spring, Arab Spring, sorry, where also people needed spaces to come together and, and act together. Um, and here we also see that the totalitarian systems for her are different from what had been there before because the public realm, as Arendt says, was already destroyed in dictatorship before. But the totalitarian systems also destroyed the private sphere. So we need this public realm to act together politically and this action, or how Arendt defines it, does have unforeseeable consequences and it's a spontaneous thing, which is in uh, contrast to mere behavior. Uh, very important for Arendt is also the, what, what, she's, what she calls natality, because usually philosophers since Socrates, Socrates are saying that what makes a human human is that he's mortal, but Arendt says before a human being is mortal, uh, uh, they do have to be born to be able to start a new beginning. And the other term which is important for us is plurality, which means that we always are in the world with other human beings and we are always born into the world which is already made by human beings. And the political tradition since Plato, uh, as well as the totalitarian systems, they tried to replace action with behavior, as Aaron calls it. They only wanted people to behave because behavior apparently is predictable and whereas uh, action isn't at all. And one famous uh, claim Arendt made too was the so-called right to have rights because based on her experiences in the uh, 20th century she said it happened that the rights only were for people who had a certain nationality or citizenship and not to everybody and um, a lawyer once uh, told me when I, when, I, I, when I mentioned this in a talk, he was like, yeah, but we have the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, why do we need this? Uh, but I guess yesterday in the talk from Anna uh, about the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss, this problem came up again, that sometimes uh, the um, rights only are for universal rights, are only for people with a certain passport. So what does Arendt say about the private? In the already mentioned book, The Human Condition, she um, undertakes a historical analysis about what has been private before, and she said that in the ancient Greek polis, um, in antiquity, the public and the private have been separated by a wall, which was the wall of laws, actually. The laws were like a pre-political, thing which uh, they kind of were defined and then after this, after the constitution of the polis, um, it, it existed like this and there were no possibility that the public affairs became private and the other way around. But then, as Arendt says, in modern times, the private things or some private things came into the public sphere um, one example for this, or the example for this, is a political economy, 
which Arendt says had been an oxymoron for the, for the ancients, um, but now it's important to talk about uh, economic affairs in the public sphere, and that's how the society came into being, the social. And then there was the intimate, which kind of was invented, as she says, to replace the private, because people need this realm, and so since it wasn't there anymore, we had the social and the intimate and the public and the private were like merged into the society. And then in totalitarian systems, as I already said, they try to influence every aspect of human life. And so ideology kind of influenced everything. And according to Arendt, um, that's what they tried. Um, they didn't succeed to, to, uh, entirely, but um, this is a public private in the totalitarian systems. Arendt herself makes clear that uh, she is interested in the local dimension of the private. And she says, this is from a talk uh, in 1975, um, just right before her death. Um, she says that it should be clear that my distinction between private and public depends on the locality where a person moves. And very closely connected to this local dimension is a proprietary dimension. In fact, the dimensions are not separated, um, like exactly separated. They, are, they very much interfere with each other, or they can interfere with each other. Um, but the proprietary dimension is, as Arendt def defines is it, uh, sorry, um, it's the property is a precondition for local privacy. She says, Privacy was like the other, the dark and hidden side of the public realm. And why to be political, meant to attain the highest possibility of human existence? To have no private place of one's own, like a slave, meant to be no longer human. So that this really sounds hard. You can see why people were criticizing her. Um, of course, slaves were human, but she's talking about the ancient um, worldview. This is what usually is considered as private in Arendt's philosophy, and what I did in my PhD thesis is that I argued there is more to, to it. And for example, I found an example for the decisional dimension of the private in her work. But before I'm going to read the quote, I just want to briefly explain the context of, of, this, of these quotes, um, because they are from the already mentioned article on Little Rock. And Little Rock is just it's a city, it's the capital of Arkansas. And uh, this article by Arendt was published in 1959, after she had first pulled it, but then it was, was still published. And um, it's based on the fact that in 1954, there was a decision by the Supreme Court in the USA that African-American students uh, were allowed to attend former all-white schools. And so the governor of Arkansas, he didn't agree with that, as did others um, uh, from, the, from some uh, states. Um, and he sent troops to prevent the students from entering the school in Little Rock. It was, it, there were only n like nine students, but still, that was what happened. And then President Eisenhower sent troops uh, too in September 1957, and so the, um, the students were protected by military to go into school. Mm. And um, so Arendt saw a picture of that in the newspaper, and there was a, um, an Afro-American girl who was uh, like harassed by her, her, um, her white uh, fellow students, or not yet fellow students. And Arendt was like, this shouldn't happen because we should never um, fight our political fights um, with our children, because the children, they need to be protected. Um, she kind of didn't think it through, so to say, um, and in the end, she kind of sided with race segregation, so that's why this, this article is always a bit irritating. 
Uh, I think it can be explained why she did this mistake, but um, yeah, that's just the context of, of these quotes. It's, I think it's important to have this in mind. But still, she says, the government has a stake in the education of my child insofar as this child is supposed to grow up into a citizen. But I would deny that government had any right to tell me in whose company my child received its instruction. The right of parents to decide such matters for their children until they are grown-ups are challenged only by dictatorships. And in the same uh, paper, she says, the right of parents to bring up their children as they see fit is a right of privacy, belonging to home and family. Parents' rights over their children are legally restricted by compulsory education and nothing else. So the decisional dimension, parents should be able to decide for their children. There are also the temporal aspects of uh, privacy. They are kind of clear, but um, in the um, debate, they are sometimes not um, underlined enough. So that's why I brought this example again from, from the uh, antiquity, where Arendt says, the disappearance of the gulf that the ancients had to cross daily to transcend the narrow realm of the household and rise into the realm of politics is an essentially modern phenomenon. Such a gulf between the private and the public still existed somehow in the Middle Ages, though it had lost much of its, its significance and changed its occasion entirely. So we see here the uh, how head of the household is allowed to cross the realm daily, um, and of course um, it was only the, the male Greek citizens who had this privilege um, and not the other members of the household. But the point was here that they had to cross it daily, so the temporal aspect of privacy. I also brought two quotes for the informational dimension of privacy in Arendt's work. And um, this is maybe something which doesn't, isn't too surprising today and for this audience, actually. Um, but I'm going to read this first quote. The police in the satellite countries kept cadre cards for every citizen in the country, on which presumably not only compromising information was recorded, but information on associations, friends, family, and acquaintances, which is much more valuable for totalitarian terror. And so some of you might already see where I'm going with this. Um, of course, today it's not, not, not a secret anymore. We, we heard the talk, or some of you might have heard the talk by Simon yesterday about the Stasi files. Of course, this, this totalitarian system did keep files on every citizen. Um, but to clarify what I want to say, I brought another, a bit longer quotation. I'm sorry for that, but it's just so good that I have to read it entirely. Um, the Okrana, the Charist, Secret police is reported to have invented a filing system in which every suspect was noted on a large card in the center of which his name was surrounded by a red circle. His political friends were designed, de designated by smaller red circles and his non-political acquaintances by green ones, etc. Cross relationships between the suspect's friends, political and non-political, and the friends of his friends were indicated by lines between the respective circles. Obviously, the limitations of this method are set only by the size of filing cards, and theoretically, a gigantic single sheet could show the relation and cross-relationships of the entire population. And this is the utopian goal of the totalitarian secret police. Now the police dreamed that one look at the gigantic map on the office wall should suffice at any given moment to establish who is related to whom and in what degree of intimacy. And theoretically, this dream is not unrealizable, unrealizable, although its technical execution is bound to be somewhat difficult. If this map really did exist, not even memory would stand in the way of the totalitarian claim to domination, such a map might make it possible to obliterate people, <coughs> sorry, without any traces, as if they had never existed at all. <coughs> sorry. Yeah, and some of you might already know what I want to say, because 
apparently Arendt is talking about metadata without using the term, and so there isn't even anymore the, um, this uh, borders of the map or of the wall because we um, have this thing where people are giving their data uh, voluntarily and um, this is just nothing surprising for this audience but uh, a figure that an intern at Facebook made from metadata about friendships between different cities. The quote is from, um, the book was uh, published in uh, 1951, so it's from the end of the 40s. Yeah. But the, the method already is, um, since she's talking about the Tsarist uh, secret police, um, yeah, the, the question was what year the quote was from. But um, yeah, um, yeah, it's already earlier, it's already, you know, like at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. So the metadata. I'm now kind of jumping into the into today to today uh, to the current debate. So um, because Arendt warned about influencing our behavior, and she said, of course, the tradition tried to replace behavior with action because um, that's what they can calculate with. They can just foresee what we are going to do. And yeah, as we all know, um, that's what's been done. I just read something about China's citizen score, which is a new thing. Apparently, they are um, collecting all information and they, they are actually giving points for the behavior, for the correct behavior. And for example, if uh, a Chinese person wants a, a visa for, to come to Europe, they must have a certain score to be able to leave the country and they are like collecting all information about uh, yeah, of, uh, internet searches, etc., and of course about relationships. I mean, it's important who is my friend when I want to leave the country, isn't it? So, um, yeah. Mm. Then, of course, there is behavioral advertising, which even has the word behavior in its title, <laughs> um, and where companies are interested in our search behavior to predict it and to send us um, targeted advertising. Uh, and of course, there is a filter bubble. Um, I guess I don't have to explain it here further that the problem is that the more I do a certain search, the more I see the, uh, the results um, which are related to this search. Interestingly, there is native advertising, um, which seems to be a newer phenomenon because, um, yeah, we do use ad blockers, etc. And so um, native advertising means that uh, um, articles in newspapers are sponsored by companies, which is also which is not new as such, but it depends on whether we can see it or not. And so this is also very interesting because it might also lead to the fact that some people see certain articles which, which others can't see, etc. Um, then, of course, there's profiling and redlining as price discrimination and uh, being able to order certain products if one lives in a certain uh, area of the city and if you live in the uh, in a less um, fav fav what's the word in a less good neighborhood, then you might not be able, for example, to order online. And uh, to describe all this, I uh, have this uh, concept. It's just briefly from Beate Rössler again that the cognitive and voluntative asymmetry of surveillance. I think that's a good idea to. Um, grasp these, what is happening, because uh, she makes a difference be between cognitive symmetry, which means I know that I am being um, under surveillance, uh, but I don't want to. That would be voluntative asymmetry. And then there's, of course, voluntative asymmetry, because uh, theoretically it might be possible that I want to be supervised. Uh, like if I get the credits from a, uh, from a customer card and um, yeah, you know, like um, I want to want them to store my data. I, I don't want them, but I want to have the bonus. So that's what I'm doing. And so I just think these are, that's why I mentioned it here. These are some interesting concepts to grasp what's really happening here. I come back to Hannah Arendt because with all these, sorry, with all these examples, we, um, can do one thing, because what Arendt also told us was that we never should 
refuse from judging. And judging means, because she, I quoted this, this never ought to have happened phrase, but it also was her goal to prevent what never ought to have happened from happening again. So what we can do to, do to prevent it is to judge about political circumstances. And um, we can judge by examples. Unfortunately, she never finished her book on judging, but there are some um, uh, lectures, etc., where, where we already get an impression on what she was aiming at. So this judging is, is sorry, um, necessary to prevent moral catastrophes, and we can do it by examples. And now I'm going to, I'm trying to combine the, the present with uh, Arendt's ideas from the 1950s uh, and 70s. Um, because I think if we see those attempts to influence our behavior, like behavioral advertising, then we have to keep in mind Arendt's warning that we need to act and not just to behave. Um, as the totalitarian state's goal was to reduce human beings to just behaving creatures. Another example on which we could use to, to judge is uh, cyber mobbing. Um, there is Arendt's warning that the tyranny of the majority of children um, can be very bad for one child uh, if children are left alone with each, with each other. I've elaborated on this in my thesis, so if every, anyone is interested in reading more on this, um, I'm happy to send you my thesis. And then we have the secret services because, um, of course, I was about to say, Arendt's uh, analysis of the totalitarian state and the origins of totalitarianism um, did uh, also, uh, she also looked at secret services and she said that what they did was uh, they, they weren't only secret services anymore, but they were secret polices. So they were secret services with the possibilities of um, police forces. And uh, she also uh, talks about the state inside of the states. So um, if we look at these examples, we also should be very careful about what's happening today. Arendt says that we should the protect the private as well as the public. And with two last uh, quotes, I'm going to come to my conclusion. Um, Arendt says, as the public realm has shrunk in the modern age, the private realm has been very much extended and the word that indicates this extension is intimacy. Today, today, this privacy is very much threatened again. Today, we are in the 1970s year, 1975. But the threats are rather from society than from government. We have to discuss if Arendt's right here, if the society, which would be, for example, companies, work together with the government. But we should also protect the public realm because they are closely interrelated um, and if one of it dies, the other one dies too. So what is necessary for freedom is not wealth, as Aaron says. What is necessary is security and a place of one's own shielded from the claims of the public. What is necessary for the public realm is that it be shielded from private interests which have intruded upon it in the most brutal and aggressive form. So the public and the private, the protection of the private does have an individual and a common value, which is one point I'm going to conclude on now. We need to pro protect the private as well as the public sphere, and the private for the public's sakes, but also the public for the private sakes, because there is this individual value of privacy, which means it has a value for the individual, for the citizens, and also a common value of privacy. That means it, if all our privacies are protected, then it's also better for the system. Um, we need to act spontaneously and our individuality and authenticity, as it is called in today's privacy discourse, need to be protected. And as Aaron says, we should never refuse from judging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. You now have the chance to ask some questions. 
We have some microphones here, one there, one there, there and there. And um, you can also ask questions um, if you were watching the live stream in the IRC chat room. So, any questions? Uh, yes, you can start. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I was really uh, interested in these Venn di diagrams you were showing about these different spheres overlapping and interacting. Also, because I'd always uh, read it a bit um, differently, or the way I, um, I sort of understood sort of Vita Activa like in particular is that this rise of the social, what you also, which kind of coincides with this disappearance of the gulf with the, uh, what you quoted. Mm -hmm. um, seen that more as a kind of, well, the social sphere arising as a kind of uh, interface or maybe sort of API between the public and, and, and private realm, which kind of informs either way. And um, in that sense, I'd be interested in maybe just understanding these dynamics that go from both realms I, um, more clearly in, uh, in that sense that maybe there's also kind of danger in withdrawing, in, in protecting the, the private sphere, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense that you can't partake in the social sphere, in the, in the political activity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to hear your take on that because that's like the downside or the other side of the medal really, um, that there's some, well, what I always took from Vita Activa is that you can't really, uh, that partaking in the political sphere is, um, basically essential to, to actually live, living your life fully in, in that mm -hmm. sense. So can you exist in this private sphere and don't you think there's also kind of danger in, in this step back in this sort of other direction? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, actually, yeah, there is this problem um, which Arendt might have not seen or, or criti some Theorists have criticized her because she didn't see what exactly what you just described that we have this this strict separation between the private and the public and especially with this uh, politic with this with this ideal of the of the ancient polis um, Then there are certain people who are excluded from participating and that's as you said in Vita Activa and human condition people should be able to participate and people should be able to decide whether they want to participate or not. And your second question, I, I heard there were two questions, um, is about the social, the reason why Arendt is so um, critical about the rise of the social is because the mass society was one reason why the totalitarian systems could come into being. That's how she puts it, because in the mass society people only behaved they only had, were interested in consuming, in working, uh, or laboring actually, and they were individualized. And this is like a pre -con one of the preconditions why the totalitarian systems, or that the totalitarian systems could use, because there were no longer the relationships between uh, the people and um, no longer um, this uh, kind of, um, of uh, sticking together. Sorry, but we have more questions here. I hope it's okay. So, over there, please. I think she was first. Um, no, we're just switching. Okay. okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, when stating that um, we should never refuse to judge, did Aaron take into account that we can only judge based on the information we have available? Yeah. Because um, mm -hmm. what I'm seeing now is that um, control over information is pretty much the mm -hmm the most important thing, as we saw yesterday with the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very important point, thank you. Um, actually, she kind of did consider it, or, or take it into account, but not in the way you just described it, or we would describe it today, because she said, um, we have to judge by examples, and uh, she didn't kind of m make clear where these examples are. Or she, she proposed that these examples could, for example, come from fairy tales. There is this um, 
uh, Ritta Blaubart, I don't know what this is, English word, like we, if, if you have this really cruel figure from a, from a, from a fairy tale, uh, if someone says, I want him to be my friend, then I should be very uh, suspicious and not uh, be friends with that person anymore. So she, she makes some propositions where we get the examples from. But the, the information where we get those from is a problem. I mean, of course, she was aware about propaganda because she's analyzing the totalitarian systems. Um, and she even says that mass um, uh, advertising has some parallels with propaganda. She already sees that. But she said a lot of information, so to finally answer your question, uh, should come from education. Or for children, for example, we should educate them like in a um, traditional way, so they, they um, learn traditional information and they learn about uh, authority and religion. And uh, but she doesn't make clear how those children who learn these traditional things can become um, uh, revolutionaries. Um, so self-determined so citizens. Sorry. Self-determined citizens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and even th those uh, those self-determined citizens who can act uh, with something new and can start something new and can start a revolution, which is a good thing in her idea, in her way, her view. Sorry. Thanks. Are there any questions from the internet? No. Okay, so we come to you. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question. Well, the um, the background that you cite as being the foundation for Arendt's analysis is then all these social contract uh, philosophers like Locke and Hegel and Kant. And then there's a clear distinction there between the private and government or like the social contract being created to prevent terror. But then with the rise of the social as being the normative entity which is creating that, um, how are we to protect the private if, uh, if there's, not very, there's not a very clear delineation between private and public in this social, if you take a, a, a private company, which in the United States is like a person, then mm -hmm. how, can you, how can you protect privacy when that demarcation becomes very unclear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, because Arendt actually, she wanted this demarcation, as you say, she, she said we need this to protect both the private and the public from the interference from the other sphere. Um, but uh, I think that it's, it's more complex these days, and that's um, why her this uh, mo model from from the ancient times doesn't apply anymore, and that's why today scholars are using the dimensions. Because, for example, my local uh, privacy, the local dimension of my privacy, can be protect perfectly protected when I'm sitting at home. But when at the same time uh, the NSA has hacked my computer, it's like um, not informational privacy that I have at that time. So that's why we need to think about it more complex. And that's also why we need to think that there are some cases where it is um, okay when the private is, oh, that's, I didn't want to say it like this, but like with the feminist critique, uh, there are cases when uh, there must be a possibility to interfere with what is, hap what is happening in the private realm. It can't be sh totally shielded mm -hmm. because there must be some exceptions. They have to be regulated, and, but uh, the state is at the same time the one who uh, needs to interfere in some cases, but it's also the, the, the actor who, um, uh, w from whom we should be protected. But then it becomes and very comp if the, if the state can co if the state says, okay, now we want this information from some private company that has been collecting data about their customers, for example, then you have this constant switching between the private and the public. That, and, and how do you, re how do you legislate that? Sorry, could you or ask I that don't again? know, I, it just seems, oh, I guess it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated, yeah. <laughs> and just uh, on the first part of your, of your question, as it, it's not only the background of Arendt, uh, all those theorists, I, quote, uh, I didn't quote them, I, I mentioned, but it's, uh, it's just the privacy discourse I was referring to. Okay. But Arendt, of course, is influenced, uh, and she's also quoting and referring to Locke, for example. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So over here again. Uh, I have actually have a question from IRC, from Akira. Um, do you think surveillance also plays a role in destroying the public sphere, the absence of which would prepare Sorry, it could you speak more to the microphone? We can't hear apologies. it Apologies. All right. Okay. Watch the um, monitor as well. Uh, do you think surveillance also plays a role in destroying the public sphere, the absence of which would prepare the way to, towards dictatorship, 
uh, also because of chilling effects, which discourage social participation and experimentation. Could you ask the question again? I'm sorry, I didn't understand very well. Sorry. I'll try to talk right into the mic. Um, do you think surveillance also plays a role in destroying the public sphere, the absence of which would prepare the way towards the dictatorship because of chilling effects which discourage social participation and experimentation? Thank you. Now I got it. Yeah, of course, surveillance does play a huge role. And I, I mean, I have like, the question was if I think it, but I have like my opinion and I read, but I read also was, um, taking into account um, surveillance in her analysis of the totalitarian states. And um, it's like what's very important or what she's criticizing is that the neighbor might become more uh, dangerous than the police if he uh, or she is, is uh, spying on me. And uh, the surveillance is like really in, as we saw also yesterday in Simon's talk, in all, the, um, all of the... Uh, uh, spheres of the society and not only like from agents uh, uh, from um, the secret services <coughs> and of course um, the surveillance sorry mm, <coughs> does destroy the public sphere as because I can't behave as I would if there weren't, weren't sorry <coughs> if there weren't any surveillance at all so by destroying my privacy it does destroy the public sphere. <laughs> okay, a very dry <coughs> air here. Um, was that question answered? Yeah, so we go over here. Uh, hello, I just wanted to bring a little bit more um, context of Foucault also mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the context of biopolitics and what you were saying on behaviorism as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting um, uh, notion of uh, of the space of public, but I wonder whether Hannah Arendt also in the later later writings also was mentioning market in, in, as market as a form also of uh, defining the uh, the uh, this fizzling gray border between the private and the public, and privatization of the private information by the market as something that actually. Uh, erases this space of public and space of mm -hmm. political as was understood by Aristotle. What I mean by that is, uh, mm -hmm. for example, and why I was, ma was mentioning Foucault, is arrival of the uh, 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 ever penetrating notion of normality and mm -hmm. that notion of normality occupying the, the space of uh, political, let's say, and politics becoming obsolete to the, to the capitalism in this way. And politics becomes too, be too big of the equation of the uh, uncertainty to be of the danger for uh, in the, in this sense of uh, of new balance of uh, effectiveness in the society and therefore the whole notion of public in our in becomes obsolete and therefore the totalitarianism arrives uh, uh, as as the necessity to increase this efficiency in the society i wonder if if uh, aren't in the later writings mentioned market in this way as mm -hmm. something that comes into the uh, into the play thank you yeah, exa yeah, thank you for mentioning uh, Foucault. Uh, unfortunately, apparently, they didn't uh, read each other, or at least they didn't quote each other, because they have a lot in common. They, I think that would have been very interesting. Um, but yeah, that actually, um, that's already in, in the Human Condition from 1958, or pu published in 1958, that Arendt is very critical about the market, not exactly in the way you just said, or you would, or Foucault would explain it, but the market is already a problem in um, the modern times, like when uh, as a society, uh, we still have the, the slide here, as when the society comes into being, as Aaron calls it, um, the, the market interests kind of do take over the public sphere. And that's the problem because there's no, uh, there's no space anymore for the political. And Aaron is, uh, thinks that the economic um, affairs shouldn't be um, discussed in the public. We have the social sphere for that, as she says, and we can, when we can discuss it, but it's not, not a political mm -hmm. um, topic. Yeah, just a little follow-up. So she meant political, and she defined political as a space of unpredictable, as a space of unknown, space, where, space of potentiality, or rather political as a space of a dialogue, or there is no such yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a space of dialogue, but it's also this unpredictabil unpredictability does play a role, and it's also an agonistic sphere because there should also every time be this uh, agon in the in the um, in this Greek way that people should be 
um, debating and kind of um, having a battle between their opinions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. One last minute for one last question and one last answer. <laughs> Your turn. I, I try oh, to give sorry. my best. Can you hear me clearly? Um, I have a question with regard to uh, totalitarianism. Um, up to now, we have had uh, systems which are very much related to one person, so to name Hitler, to name Stalin, and uh, whomever you want to call. And now I see a, a change here to a, a multitude of uh, yeah, corporations, if you want to, mm -hmm. and uh, the state and the politicians are uh, like a Muppet show. Mm -hmm. And I would have, to have a question whether you want to elaborate on that. Is there a change in the definition of mm -hmm. uh, totalitarianism, and uh, how does this affect? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I try to answer briefly. Um, the the Arendt, Arendt's idea of totalitarianism is with some others called the classical definition. And after that, people have uh, expanded the, the definition of totalitarianism because, for example, for Arendt, this uh, um, Führer principle, so to say, like you only have one person at the top, as you said, is important for um, a real totalitarian state. But then also later on she kind of changes this a little bit and she speaks about totalitarian elements and, and, and um, yeah, phenomenons. Um, but I, I'm not sure, I, I think you're right and I, I think one could apply Arendt's um, theory because she also sees that there are those puppets who are being played like a, in a puppet show by a puppet master. Um, but um, yeah, actually it's different from what you just described is different from what she defines as like clearly totalitarian. Okay, thank you very much for thank your you. good talk about Hannah Arendt thank and you. privacy. Thank, thank you. you. Give her a warm applause. <laughs>